Now, a gentleman by the name of Carl von Clausewitz, right, clearly not one of my relatives, was the first person to ever um, coin a term uh, that's been used to describe part of the experience or part of the reality uh, of war. And the term that he came up with is this one right here. It's the fog of war. And the fog of war is a reality in every war because in every war there is chaos. In every war, in every battle, um, precision and certainty is always at odds with speed and agility. And every decision, um, every action is in fact a series of trade-offs between those. Officers and soldiers um, become separated. Orders um, get confused. Uh, communication, it, it dissipates. In battle, bombs are exploding, bullets are hitting all around you. Oftentimes, you, you have no idea where the attack is actually coming from or how many enemies there are. All you know um, is that you're under attack. Your brain is not able um, to process all that is happening around you. Your adrenaline, it begins to spike, and so your brain, it actually narrows um, your field of view, and so you get tunnel vision. In the fog of war, soldiers will often fire in the direction that they simply think the enemy is in, oftentimes killing or wounding some of their own. See, we live in something like that fog here because oftentimes what we experience in life in this world, it feels like a battle. Now, in battle, the solution to the fog of war um, is, is actually quite simple. It's to know what your objective is, who the enemy is, and how are you going to accomplish that objective. We're going to read beginning in first, Second Corinthians chapter 5, beginning at verse 14. The Apostle Paul says this. He says, it is Christ's love that compels us, right? It's Christ's love that compels us. Not God's judgment, um, not fear of hell, not fear of consequences, um, not fear of anything, in fact. It's not the wrath of God. No, he says it is Christ's love. It's Jesus' love for me, and, and that results in, in my love for Jesus, and that makes me appreciate and understand Jesus' love for me even more. That's what compels him. And see, this is what compels us, and this is what keeps us focused on communicating the message of the gospel, right? And, and this little word, again, this Greek word compels here, um, it's actually the Greek word syneko. And it's used all throughout the New Testament, and it carries a number of different meanings uh, along with it. And, and it, it kind of goes like this. It's telling, the Apostle Paul is telling us that, that Christ's love, that Jesus' love, it guards us, right? That it guides us. It actually it keeps us on the right path. That Jesus' love um, unifies us. That this is the thing we rally behind. The thing that unifies all of us is what it is that Christ did for us on the cross. That his love was demonstrated to us. That's the thing that focuses us. And that's the thing that focuses our attention and it focuses our activity and our resources as a church. It's Christ's love, Paul says, that motivates us or drives us or compels us. And so when I read this this past week thinking about this message, today, I, I thought, okay, this is it, right? No matter what battle we're facing in life, no matter what we feel is going on around us, no matter what the enemy tries to throw at it, this is the mission. This is why we're here. This is the reason God has put us here. Because when Jesus came into the world, the truth is, it was good news. And anybody who resists Jesus, right, my opinion, they, they just don't understand that the message of Jesus is, in fact, good news. And the truth is, I've never met someone who wanted to resist good news. Whatever it is that a person is resisting about Jesus, I would argue, is a mischaracterization about or a misunderstanding about the message of Jesus. The Apostle Paul continues and he says this, It compels us because we are convinced. We're convinced that one died for all and therefore all died, right? Talking about Jesus, that one died for all, so therefore all died, which is just a fancy way of saying that all of us, right? All of us, we were all as good as dead because on our own, we were actually separated from God, from our heavenly father. And so because of that, Jesus died for us so that we would not die and then be eternally separated from him. And when the Apostle Paul says all, right, he means all. That's what was so compelling about Jesus' love. Jesus didn't just die for the people who were like him, and Jesus didn't just die for the people who liked him. 
Because when Jesus died for the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul was nothing like Jesus. In fact, the Apostle Paul hated Jesus. And so this required some convincing. And the Apostle Paul says, you know what? What he did for me, that was pretty convincing. He died for all that those who live, right? Those of us who follow Jesus, who have placed our faith in Jesus, those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. The message of, of Jesus that God has done something for us. He's not just trying to get something from us. He says the people who realize that, the people who understand this, he says, they say to themselves, I can't just live for myself anymore. I can't just say thank you to my Heavenly Father for everything you've given me and then go about my merry way. No. When a person realizes, he says, when a person understands, when it dawns on them what it is that God has actually done for them, the Apostle Paul says, listen, that person can no longer live for themselves. The response to God for a person who follows Jesus is to say to our Heavenly Father, okay, because of what you've done for me, how could I dare, why would I dare live Live for myself, right? I, I can't possibly do that. I would never do that. I am so grateful for, for the, that you made the first move. I am so grateful that you fixed something that was broken. I can't just keep that to myself. There's no way. There's no way that I could live for myself. And so I'm going to offer myself my life to you, not because I'm afraid of what you'll do if I don't, not, not because I'm afraid that you won't bless me. Not, not because I'm afraid of anything. No, I offer my life to you, Heavenly Father, because of what you've done for me. Your love compels me. You're not trying to pry open my greedy little hands. No. It's like, what else could I do in light of all that you've done for me? And then the Apostle Paul introduces a powerful, powerful word that all of us are familiar with in a slightly different context. He goes and he says this. He says, all of this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry, we'll come back to that in a minute, of reconciliation. Now, again, you know what it means to reconcile two things, right? To reconcile two things is to take two things um, that are not compatible and make them compatible. And see, this is what the Apostle Paul is saying, that on your own, Right? And on my own, I was not reconciled to God. That we were, in fact, irreconcilable. That we had irreconcilable differences. Right? I was a sinner and God was not. I was unholy and God was holy. I was water, God was fire. That we were irreconcilable. This is the amazing thing about the gospel. Is that God actually wanted to reconcile with you. And then the Apostle Paul. He says that God gave to us the ministry. Now, in the Greek, this word that we translate here as ministry is not a religious word. See, when you see the word ministry, you think me, right? You think pastor, you think priest, you think church, you think religion. But in the Greek word, it's not a religious word. It's just the, the, the Greek word diakonia. Diakonia, and all it means, it means the mission, the objective, the, the task, or the responsibility, right? In other words, the Apostle Paul is saying, okay, God has done something for you. God has done something for me. And now God says, I, I, want, um, I want you collectively, I want all of you to partner with me, to partner with him, to help other people in the world understand that I want something for them because I am for them. To which if we're paying attention, we would be asking the Apostle Paul, okay, wait, but Paul, wait a minute, how, how, how? Right, because you just said, you just said we were irreconcilable. You, you just said that we had irreconcilable differences. So what changed? That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. How? By not counting people's sins against them. See, you understand what this means? If God is no longer counting your sin against you, you know, this is huge for some of you. That means that you are actually free to not count your sin against you either. Do you understand what this means? It means that because God is no longer counting your sin against you, you're actually free to not count other people's sins against them. Right? Unless, of course, you have a higher standard than God. You know what this means? It means that God no longer counts your sin against you. 
that when you receive forgiveness from your heavenly Father, right, that empowers you to forgive yourself, to forgive other people, and even as many of us have experienced in life, to actually experience reconciliation. Here's kind of a summary statement for you today. The love of Christ compels us, right? Those of us who lead in the church, those of us who volunteer in the church, those of us who give and serve and do all that we need to do to come together every week and make this whole thing happen. The love of, of Christ compels us. This is, this is wh why we do what we do. And what is it we do? We urge people to be reconciled to God. That's it. That's what we do. This is why we do what we do. And we're trying to make sure that this is the thing that is out front, in front of everything else that we do.